Goodman household, are you queued up for the chimes? We believe we are. Can you hear us? We can hear you. Okay. One, move into the front. One, two, ready, go. Morning, First Prize. We love you. We heard, saw, and felt the energy. Thank you, Goodmans. <laughs> Pippi, are we doing fast, slow, or medium? Medium is the best. Medium is the best, you know? I think so. All right. Welcome home, children of God. Every time medium is good. Every time what? Every time medium is good, and now it's your turn, Leslie. Thank you, Pippi. Around this font, we declare the truth that life is deeper and wider than what is on the surface. You and I are called through our baptism, and we welcome one another every Sunday morning as we remember it with one voice. Welcome home, children of God. Let's join together in our call to worship. In our worship, God is glorified as we reflect on our actions as stewards in and of God's world. Glory given is a vulnerable act. With sense of pride and wonder, we continue to imagine our God as creator, redeemer, and friend. In our worship, God is glorified, not as an object of adoration, but as a subjectifying force that calls us forward. We are compelled to worship by a longing that seeks the light of day, a freedom from the pit deep within us. Let us worship God. May our shared religion contribute to freeing the God-given longing. Amen. It is great to have Randy back with us. He reports that recovering from surgery has been pretty reasonable, although work is still very demanding. Randy, welcome back and thanks for your leadership. This morning's prayer of confession is a little bit different. It's an invitation to visualization. And so what's on your screen will be read entirely by me. And you're invited to listen and to visualize uh, the box in different ways that I will speak to. So this prayer of confession is a time of discipline when we can square up with ourselves, square up with God and neighbor, and come again at the challenges of living faithfully in our context. So let us pray. 
O oh Lord our God, we confess there may be a box that surrounds our emotions. You are invited to remain silent as you visualize holding a box. Help us, O oh Lord, to feel outside the box. We confess, O oh Lord, there may be a box that surrounds our thinking. You are invited to remain silent as you visualize gently lifting and replacing the lid of a box. Help us, O oh Christ, to think outside the box. We confess that there may be a box that surrounds our habits. You are invited to remain silent as you visualize removing the lid and holding an open box. Help our hope, Great Spirit, that we may behave outside the box. God of all prison reform, reform us now. You are invited to remain silent as you visualize taking something precious from the box and holding it. May we imagine ways to aid your reform in our world, O oh great creator. This we pray in and through Christ, lifting the silent prayers of our hearts. Amen and amen. The peace we receive is not a peace that we can hold. It is overflowing. We are compelled to give and to share it without condition. The peace of Christ be with each of you. Extend the peace of Christ in the chat box or join your voices to the chorus. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of, Christ. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. 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 Of we'll turn Peace to of Christ from Jim Dalton. <laughs> Peace of Christ to you too. So we'll turn to our spirit box time for the last month and this month we are doing a blessing of the animals. And uh, this week we have Katie King who's home for a little while from college. A little bit more. For, uh, she'll be returning soon but she's bringing with her I believe her new kitten, Butler, a.k.a. Smalls, is his nickname. Katie, are you queued up for the Spirit Box time? So one of the ways that you can enjoy the Spirit Box time is to click speak Speaker View, and it may, on your computer, give you a bigger image of Katie and Smalls. Katie, share with us a little bit. Okay, this is Butler, and like, Mom told you we call him Smalls because he's really tiny. Um, he's not really happy with me right now because he was cleaning himself and I took him away from that. Um, but in a minute, I'll give him some almond milk and he'll be happy again. 
Um, we named him Butler because he just kind of showed up. I'm sorry. Because he showed up at our door one day. Okay. So he's not happy with me, so I'm going to put him down now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he hit me. But he's right here. The price, in case anybody wondered. So Katie, what do you love most about Butler? Um, well, except for that one moment that everyone saw, he's a really loving cat. Um, and he really, really loves human interaction, which is kind of difficult to find with kitties. So um, except for that one moment, he's really loving and caring. So what do you enjoy most about taking care of Butler? Um, that he's so loving and caring, except for that moment. He's, he cuddles with me a lot, and that's really cute. <laughs> so, yep, that's, that's the best thing about him. Well, I know a little bit about Butler, and he's uh, kind of uh, been a little sick and needed a little extra care, and so uh, you've been really great at providing it. Butler was a stray who made its way, made his way to Katie. So let's take a minute and offer a special blessing on Butler and other stray animals like him. And then we will uh, say our prayer that is a custom for us during our children's time. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are in wide wonder of the way that creatures who might thrive best alongside human beings find themselves lost and alone. They may be hungry, they may be sick, and they are in need of healing like any creature among us. So we are mindful of Butler and all the strays in the world who are cared for in places like the Humane Society, Fuzzy Friends, or in neighborhoods where um, people take mercy through food and kindness. We too have experienced what it is to be lost and in need. So we are among the creatures that seek the blessing. Hear this prayer as we offer the blessing in your name. Amen. And now together, let's do God be in my head, God be in my heart, God be on my left, God be on my right, God be beneath me, God be above me, God be in the faces of all who love me. Amen. So we are going to read. I'm sorry, I have to get my Bible. We're going to read a stretch of scripture um, and I'll bookend it. I want to commend the entirety of it to you, but for time and for screen space, we've distilled it down. From Acts, the 26th chapter, through Acts 28, there is a great and dramatic reading of Paul's incarceration and journey to Rome. We'll read a bit of it um, this morning, and commentators, when you read about this passage, argue about its historicity. There'll be a lot of regional names in some of what I read. But like all great scripture, there are components of history, and then there is a narrative that seeks to transcend history and time in order to speak to us within our context. So let's offer a word of prayer and then move in to the book of Acts. Gracious God of time and place, we are mindful that we are both there and here that we have worked so hard to arrive, it is a challenge to be fully present. So we ask the grounding of your spirit may settle us in. The provocation of your spirit may open our hearts. That the profound nature of your spirit may soften our minds grounded and opened and softened, we may be illumined. These things we pray as we beseech your spirit. Amen. In the 26th chapter of Acts, Paul is in front of the governors, uh, the, the governing bodies that are pronouncing judgment on him. And note that they do not think incarceration is the right path 
but the momentum of that justice process carries him toward it anyway. Here's the reading. After Paul had finished speaking, the king got up, and with him the governor, and Bernice, and those who had been seated with them. And as they were leaving, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man have, could have been set free if he had not appealed to the emperor. Then we return to a first person narrator in Acts. When it was decided at the verse at chapter 27, when it was decided that we were to sail for Italy, they transferred Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort. His name was Julius. Embarking on the ship, Adra Metium, that was set to set sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to the sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius, the guard, treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends there in Sidon to visit. Putting out to the sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. They went the long way. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, today is, the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we've jumped to the 33rd verse, and in between the fourth verse and the 33rd, there's a terrific storm. And the sailors who are guarding Paul have come to despair. Everyone is tired and ragged. And in the 33rd verse, Paul prepares to provide for them. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you've been in suspense and remaining without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he had said this, he took bread and gave, giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat it. Then all of them were encouraged and they took some food for themselves. We were all 267 persons on that ship. And after everyone had satisfied their hunger, they lightened the ship by throwing wheat into the sea. When we finally arrived in Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier who was guarding him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I have not ever told you the story of my Sam I am. My story of Sam I am began a long time ago in Kansas, but it culminated, it culminated as Sam and I, a beloved member of our Kansas church, we're strolling through a corridor. This was a corridor of a newly finished basement. The basement had joined the old church building with an adjacent house. We had managed the differences in elevation at the joining of two old structures. And Sam, who is an expert in roof lines and foundations and all things building strength, we're strolling through the basement corridors. We were examining the integrity of rooms. We would open one door, look in, examine the room, and pull the door closed. He was on the right side of the hallway and I was on the left. And as I was pushing a door open to examine a new room and then pull the door closed, I began to turn as Sam's hand was on the doorknob to push that door open. I trusted him to evaluate the integrity. So it surprised me when he pulled the door closed and kept his eyes on the doorknob and said to me, I have to confess to you, I, Sam, am not a good man. I knew Sam pretty well, so I retorted with a joke, Sam, I know you're no good. Let's keep evaluation moving along. And so Sam did, but his hand stayed on the doorknob of a closed room. He said to me, I'm serious about it. I need to tell you, I need to confess. I am a convicted felon. I looked at him, he looked at me and I said, well, and we fumbled around for things to talk about as we continued open opening and closing doors and examining the integrity of the space. I said, tell me how it happened, Sam. And he said, I was set by life. And then I set myself within my life so that the winds were against me. 
In our visiting, our eyes were opened more fully to one another. There was something of a release in Sam's eyes and shoulders, and perhaps in mine, as we continued visiting the listening and the speaking on the matter of an important subject. At the end of the conversation, Sam said, I feel somewhat better, though I am the same person I was 10 minutes ago. As I look back on the story of my Sam I am, I realize that what we were doing was attending to our mental health, the mental health of a mainstream culture that I represented and the mental health of an incarcerated, felonized culture that Sam in part represented, but the truth of it is that he and I, each one, represented a little bit of both a faithful, giving, loving, hardworking member of the church. <laughs> My Sam I am. Folks, mental health is one of the primary concerns of the gospel. And the gospel means to tell you and to tell me that mental well-being, strength for the journey, is managed through visiting. I'll go so far as this morning to say that the key to mental health, the key to mental health is visiting. Think on the gospels. They do not talk to you and to me about how to do rituals in our sanctuaries. <laughs> Those sanctuaries are precious to us. The gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John demonstrate how it is that we're to visit with one another on questions of authority, on questions about the meaning of life and questions of self-worth. Jesus violates healthcare regulations of his day in his visiting with right and appropriate touches that are primarily through his presence and his spoken word. And Paul models this Christ-like itinerancy, this intent to visit in each one of his epistles, each one of his letters, where he visits. And we only hear one side of the visiting, where he visits on the matters of authority, on the meaning in life, and on questions of self-worth. Paul encourages people to a model set forth by Christ, which is a model of visiting. Paul's speech within the book of Acts, the, the um, 27th chapter, is not new literature. There is a precedent set in older literature, the Odyssey and the Aeneid, in this older literature, it is common that in the middle of the storm, a hero, a hero rises up to make a speech. Agamemnon or Odysseus make a woeful speech in the middle of the storm about their own hardship. The book of Acts riffs on this tradition within literature and provides a surprising component Paul's speech is not a lament and a woe of his circumstance, but a pep talk to all those gathered, some of whom contribute to the strength of incarcerating him. Paul encourages people to the journey, encourages them to their strength and their role, and he serves up some food. As we said in the call to worship, for Jesus and for Paul, God is not merely an object lesson to get right in the head, right thinking about God. Rather, God is a subjectifying force that puts us in motion toward one another to share in honor and discovery of one another.
if the Gospels mean to contribute to well-being through the act of visiting, we must acknowledge as we conclude this series on prisons, freedom, and incarceration, that mental health and health care within the prison systems is substandard in our nation. Note the mental health exchange that is at work in our Acts reading. The jailer, or the guard, Julius, shows mercy and allows Paul the strength of visiting with his friends at a port. The crew on the ship in disarray receives care and wisdom from the incarcerated one. The book of Acts means to say to us in the midst of life's storms and in the midst of crime and punishment, there is an essential care that must be given for the gospel to survive. Prisons are as symbolic as any church structure. They represent. Perhaps they represent, like in the story of Sam, my Sam I am, good people or bad people. Inside the prison are the bad people, outside the prison are the good people. Perhaps prisons represent a safety that we can lock away what is dysfunctional. What do the prisons represent and what do our sanctuaries represent? For some, prisons represent the challenge and the call of Matthew 25 that we should visit. <laughs> to the least. Folks, visiting is such a powerful and precious etiquette. It is not ranting on social media. It is not the navel gazing of a private journal. Visiting has a mutuality. It is an invitation to approach and the acceptance to make the approach. It is listening and speaking. And there is nothing more magical in the human journey than to truly visit. You and I visit with familiar folks for our own mental health. You have called people, you have sat on porches, you have socially distanced, but for your mental health and my mental health, we have visited one another. But visiting the familiar or the preferential is not an end in and of itself, for it does not extend far enough into the cultural mental well-being. Rather, visiting to the preference, to the familiar, builds the skill set within us so that we can visit a little fur further with the less familiar. But just when we are ready to extend our reach, something like the temptation of guilt arrives to make sure that we keep our circle small. Guilt says, now you wouldn't want to feel guilty and get yourself in over your head with someone you really didn't like all that much. Something like guilt arrives just when we're ready to stretch out beyond the familiar and the preferential and says, now you wouldn't want your honor to be sullied by interacting with that one or that one. But like all temptations, the arrival of something like the voice of guilt can be handily dealt with. If we understand that visiting is not the subsuming of our honor or the depletion of our resources, but the fundamental exchange by which we share in an equal exchange honor and we engage the value of learning something new. 
I've been thinking to myself this entire sermon series, King, how are you going to practice what you preach in this series? So I returned to cite a website that I noted in a previous sermon. The website is called Solitary Watch. It is a watch guard group on solitary confinement. We have previously spoken of the intensity of solitary confinement on the human and cultural experience. Solitary Watch provides the opportunity for an individual like me to sign up to be a pen pal with a person in solitary confinement. And so when I was asking myself, how are you going to practice what you preach? How are you going to get just beyond <laughs> the familiar and the preferential? you sanctuaried preacher. So I filled out a small email form and they emailed me back a couple of paper, a uh, couple of PDF files that assured me they cared about how I might be talked out of this opportunity. Solitary Watch provides a mailbox in Washington, DC and all my letters go to that PO box. And then they are relayed to a particular inmate to which I have been assigned. And while my first name is my own, they encourage me to use a pseudonym, a, a um, false last name. They encourage me to write the first letter asking if the person might be interested in corresponding with me, assuring me they'll assign another if I don't hear back in six to eight weeks. It is a guided visitation. But to date, the only way to communicate with anybody in solitary confinement is to write a good old fashioned letter. <laughs> and the truth is, Solitary confinements are within prisons and they are within the depths of human beings. And correspondence between the two is the intent to outmaneuver and outstrategize solitary confinement for communal cultural strength. <laughs> Folks, communion is not green eggs and ham, but it is a most unusual meal. My Sam, I am. I am Sam. As locked down and as imperfect. Paul, the incarcerated murderer. Oh, wait, I have that wrong. I think the stoning was sanctioned. I think the visiting was incarcerated. Hmm. Where is the justice? Where is the question? Where is the conversation within the lockdown that there may be, through the visiting, keys to the kingdom that is an appropriate freedom in which we share space as human beings? Paul's journey ends in incarceration. Jesus' journey ends or extends beyond. May the church that survives Paul, that communes with the living Christ, move beyond lockdown. And may we do it together with a good old fashioned art. Amen. We're going to affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed and the Apostles' Creed can be found on your screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from On the night of his arrest, with friends gathered round who were not entirely certain about him, Jesus took bread at a shared table of visitors and broke it open and gave it to them as if it was his own life, saying, this is my body given for you. Whenever you take from it, do this remembering me. In the same way, he took a shared cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of a new covenant, filled by the shedding of my own life, energy, and force. And as it is filled to overflowing, each time you drink of it, drink on it as you think of me. So every time you and I share this meal, we proclaim the death of Jesus, and the continual arrival of Christ into our lives. You in your own homes have elements ready, maybe coffee and a cookie, maybe a little bread and some juice, whatever your elements, receive them this morning as a sacrament and allow the sharing of the sacrament across the distance to bind us together as a community of faith. Our deacon Laura Munn will lead us in a prayer as we share our elements. Let us pray together. Gracious God, it is a blessing to worship and pray together and share the communion of your Holy Spirit across the spaces that divide us now. Thank you for those who have worked to make this possible. Thank you for the mission and ministry of our congregation and for our leaders. Thank you for all the signs of your love that you place around us. We are grateful for the care and support of our families and friends, sustaining us through difficult days and lifting us up when we rejoice. Remind us to rest and savor the best things you provide for us in each moment. Caring creator disasters shake us and we call to you. Hear our prayers for those in Hidalgo County whose lives have been broken up by Hurricane Hannah. We pray for the survivors and the responders. Pour out courage and stamina for them along with the resources they need to rebuild with strength. Merciful Father, comfort those who mourn. Hear our prayers for Bob Street and all who loved Susan Ducey. Envelop all your grieving children with your everlasting love. It is awful to be sick, great physician. It is hard to wait for test results. It is exhausting to wait for healing. The combination of illness, worry, and unnecessary guilt can be crushing. Relieve us with your peace and comfort and keep us mindful that you are the God of even the tiniest parts of this infinite universe. Nothing is unknown to you and you see us and care us care for us even when we suffer. It is terrible to fear for our livelihoods. We hear the messages of scripture encouraging us to resist worrying, but it is so hard to be encouraged. Show us how to help the suffering. God of steadfast, generous love, we pray that we can continue to carry your loaves and fishes to your people with love and hospitality. 
It is hard to accept change, especially when it's uninvited. Your people have always coped with a lot of change, eternal God, and your guiding spirit has been with your people in the wilderness before. We pray for guidance and wisdom for our leaders. We pray for safety for our country, particularly our schools. Refresh us with your love, holy God. We offer you what we have. Break us open to share your bounty with the world. As followers of the risen Lord, we are bold to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You and I are finding right ways to go out into the world, and we are charged to do so with a peace. This has always required courage. But you and I can hold fast to what is good. We can return no person evil for evil. We can strengthen the faint-hearted. We can support the weak. We can help the suffering. We can honor all people in right ways. And it can be our loving and serving of the Lord our rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. This is possible for you and for me because we are enveloped by our Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, and Friend. Amen. Thank you all for coming to worship. There's some announcements that uh, you can check in with or you can simply chat with one another. Um, so good of you to come today. Blessings to all of you. <laughs>